Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here. Today, I'm going to be talking about what is in GraphQL. When I first started with GraphQL, I had so many misconceptions about it. I thought it was like a graphing software, and I was like, why do I even need to use it? I wasn't super bought into the hype. So I want to take this time to kind of debunk some of those misconceptions and walk you through what isn't GraphQL. Let me introduce myself. I'm Shruti Kapoor. I'm a senior software engineer at PayPal. I've been working at, with GraphQL for over two years, um, and I love cha solving challenging problems with GraphQL, JavaScript, React. I also send newsletters on these topics at tinyletter.com slash shrutikapoor08. If there's anything that I'm more passionate about, that it, it will be dev jokes. So I'm going to be asking you questions and I will monitor the live chat here. So you can put your answers in there. So the first question for you is, where do programmers hang out? And I'm gonna look at the YouTube live chat for this. So you can put your answers there. I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to answer. So where do programmers hang out? GitHub, cafe. Yeah, programmers do hang out at cafe. Programmers hang out at Foo Bar. All right, next one. How did HTML get drunk? The answers are great. How did HTML get drunk? With JavaScript? <laughs> Watching the market tag too long. That's a good one. I like that. The HTML got drunk by having too many BR. <laughs> All right, next one. What did the developer say to the Git repository? <laughs> Drinking its own dog. That's pretty good. <laughs> what did the developer say to the Git repository? The developer said, fork you. So if you want to learn more dev jokes, you can go to my GitHub, where you can find all the dev jokes. Now, I'm super excited to announce this for the very first time, that to add a gift dev joke, now you don't need to go to dev jokes repository anymore and create a pull request like you had to and write markdown. But with the help of dgraph, there is a UI with which you can add dev jokes. So let me quickly demo how this works. So you go click on the create button here, add a dev joke. Let's say you can select what kind of jokes you want, if it's a text joke or a meme. So let's say it's a text joke. And the joke can be, let's pull it from one of these jokes here. There's a really cool joke that somebody added yesterday. What is a computer's favorite beep? An algorithm. So I'm going to add this joke here. You can copy and paste. And it shows up in an image right away. So it's super easy to check it out. Super easy to read. It's posting the joke. Joke posted. Go back to the home page. And the joke is all the way. I lost the joke. 
Where is it? Where is it? There it is, an algorithm. So now it's super easy to add a joke and you can also spend your free time at work browsing dev jokes. So I wanna, I wanna give thanks to the DGraph team, especially Omar, Naman, and Minhaj for helping me out with this dev jokes app. This jo app is powered through DGraph and built on slash GraphQL. So thank you so much again, team, for the, your efforts. So coming back to the talk, we're gonna be talking about the misconceptions of GraphQL. This is what we're gonna talk about today. I'll briefly talk about the differences between GraphQL and REST from a communication to the API perspective. I'll talk about some common misconceptions of GraphQL, some parts of GraphQL that I found really useful in development, and if you're interested, how you can get started with GraphQL. So the first part is the difference between GraphQL and REST from a, an API communication perspective. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about this library app. And basically the only thing you need to worry about is two fields that we're going to be uh, using for the app, which is the title of a book and author. The title of a book would be a string and author is going to be an array of strings. So as you know, a book can have one author or more than one author. Similarly, our data would be an array of one or more than one authors. So the first step in sending an API, send, uh, talking to an API is understanding what data we need to send to the server. In REST, what we do is we inspect an API documentation. Um, we look at what resources we might need to use. So we might have endpoints like slash books, slash authors. We look at the sample response that it sends and the parameters we'll need to send. And that's how we'll think about how we need to construct our request. In GraphQL, what you need to do is first think about what data you need. You need. So in our case, we need the book, its title, and its author. So those are two fields. The title and the author are the two fields that we need. The next step is now I need to send a request or create a request for the server. In REST, we'll have an endpoint like slash books and author. So what I may need to do is that if a book has an author, two or more authors and I need to find out more information about the author, I might need to get an ID of the book from slash books endpoint and then use that ID to send it to the slash author endpoint. So I'm using one endpoint to get an ID and then using that ID to talk to another endpoint to get more data on that ID. In GraphQL, what we do is we only have one endpoint, the slash GraphQL endpoint. So to send or to get data, we need to first understand the schema of fields that we need. So for example, here we need book, the title, and for author, we need the name. So instead of talking to multiple endpoints, we're only gonna be talking to one endpoint. The next step is to understand what we need to send. For REST, it comes down to what kind of operation we send. The most common types of operations are get, post, patch, delete, and put. Whereas with GraphQL, the most kind of operation, most common operations are query and mutation. Once we have figured that out, we'll need to build the resources on the server side. So for REST, this comes down to resource implementation. This is typically done in Java or JavaScript. And so what we'll be doing is retrieve authors. It accepts these parameters like author ID, and then we'll be sending our resources and talking to the APIs in our resource implementation. Similarly, in GraphQL, we'll have a resolver for each field. For example, if you have a book or if you have title as a field, then you'll have a resolver for that specific field. And the final step when the server has sent data back to the client is to parse that received data. In REST, as you may know, you get everything that the server has sent you. So you may have fields in addition to the ones that you requested. But with GraphQL, you only get the fields you requested. So if you ask for title and name of the author, that's the only two fields you'll need to get. So this way you'll have to parse very little data on your client side with GraphQL. So that was a basic difference between GraphQL and REST and how to communicate with an API. Now let's talk about the common myths of GraphQL. 
So to understand what are the common myths in the community, I wanted to do my research and hear from the community. So like any professional researcher, I did my research on Twitter. And I asked the community, what are the common misconceptions you have with GraphQL? And what are the common mis what are some myths that people who, when you introduce GraphQL do have, especially the new folks? So here are the common misconceptions that the community has right now. The biggest which misconception which I had as well was GraphQL is similar to like a graphing software or GraphQL equals graph or that GraphQL equals SQL because of the QL in its name. Another common misconception is that GraphQL only works with graph type data. And the one big misconception that I had when I started was that data fetching kind of works magically. So if I have a field book, it just knows what to get. Another one is that GraphQL replaces Redux. A, a big misconception that is still existing is that REST and GraphQL can't coexist. And because they can't coexist, it is difficult to introduce in an, in an existing project. A lot of front-end folks also talk about GraphQL, so that kind of also leads to the misconception that GraphQL is only used for front-end. Another big misconception is that GraphQL would write the database queries itself. You don't need to do the magic. And that GraphQL requires complicated clients. So let's start debunking these myths. The first one being GraphQL equals graph. I think the common misconception here is that it's kind of used for like Facebook's graph or it's somehow related to D3JS. So the graph in GraphQL is used to represent a graph type of structure. So for example, you need to think about how the data connects with each other. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a graph form, but for example, here, let's say we had four books. Every book could have one or multiple authors. The author would have a name and email and bio. Out of those three fields, we're only interested in name. So this way we are connecting a book to an author and we are drawing the, the graph between a book and an author. So it's kind of conceptual graph instead of an actual data structure type graph. So that's where the graph in GraphQL comes from. Another misconception is that GraphQL is equal to SQL because of the query language um, or that it's a query language only for a graph database. So SQL, a SQL query may look something like this, like select star from books where title equals pragmatic programmer. So in GraphQL, instead of saying, instead of talking to the database, like select star from books, select or defining which table to read, instead we say, get me a book with the title, the pragmatic programmer. So it's kind of different way of thinking. With GraphQL, we're actually querying an API instead of querying a database. It's not a database language. However, there are libraries like dgraph that are built completely in GraphQL and they talk to database in GraphQL as well. Another misconception is that data fetching works magically. Um, and I think this comes from the fact that we say you can get books and GraphQL will give you only the books. Um, so when people say that, they actually mean that the resolver that you write will actually only give you books instead of GraphQL doing the data fetching magically for you. So just like in REST, you will need to write each of the resolvers and data implementations on the server side yourself. So every field will need to have a resolver. Another misconception is that GraphQL replaces Redux. And I think the misconception here is that why bother with GraphQL if I only have, uh, why bother with like Redux if I have GraphQL or GraphQL is just a fancy JS library. So the thing is that with the help of GraphQL, you get less data on the client. GraphQL is a way for talking to the APIs. So you still get data on the client, with help of Redux, you actually manage that data on the client. Redux is a state management library. So now that you're getting less data, the need of using Redux reduces, but it doesn't mean that GraphQL is a state management library. GraphQL is used for calling an API, whereas Redux is used for managing the data that comes back from an API. 
So you will still need to manage your data somehow on the client side, but there are some libraries you can use to do that, which is like Apollo Client, Redux, or you could just use React Hooks itself. Another common misconception is that you can't have REST with GraphQL. And I think the beauty of GraphQL is that you can combine different types of APIs. They don't even need to be all GraphQL. You can have REST APIs, you can have SOAP APIs, you can have GraphQL APIs, and you can get exactly the data that you need. So it's kind of like building a unified API on top of all these distributed APIs that you may have. And this works really well in an enterprise level architecture. And we leverage this heavily at PayPal as well. So we may have five different APIs and we only need maybe like one field from that API and all these APIs could be REST. With the help of GraphQL, we build like an orchestration layer on top of these REST APIs. So instead of getting tons of data back, we only pick one field and then use that to call another REST API. A very cool library that does this really well is OneGraph. Um, and it's able to talk to multiple different APIs underneath like Twitter and GitHub and Stripe and Spotify with just one GraphQL endpoint. So for you, it looks like you're talking to a GraphQL endpoint, but underneath it's actually talking to multiple different REST APIs. So GraphQL does this really well. And I think that's very powerful. Another common misconception is that because it takes so long to adopt GraphQL, it's very difficult to introduce in an existing project. And this, could come from the fact that people think it's all or nothing. They would need to replace or rewrite their entire REST API in order to introduce GraphQL, or it's only meant for like greenfield projects, which is starting from scratch. So uh, this is another thing that we leverage very heavily at PayPal, which is to introduce GraphQL incrementally, one component at a time, one endpoint at a time. What we try to do is we pick one endpoint, see how that's performing, if there's any data in there that we are not using, and if that's a good client for GraphQL, we convert it into a GraphQL endpoint and see how that performs. And if it does very well, we convert other endpoints as well. So this way we are incrementally adopting GraphQL one component at a time. Another common misconception is that GraphQL is only for front-end folks. And I think it probably stems from the fact that front-end folks are so passionate about GraphQL, just like I am. And But I think that the real beauty of GraphQL comes from the back-end, because on the back-end, you're able to not only look at what data is coming, but you're also able to analyze which endpoints are not being used. So for example, in my book, an author endpoint, if, I'm, if I can say that um, author field is not being used, I have the power to deprecate it without impacting customers who are actually using it currently. If I can see the analytics, if I can see the data that the, the uh, author field is not being used, I can deprecate it and let the customers know that this field would be deprecated in the future. So I think the real beauty of GraphQL actually comes from the back end. In the front end, we kind of use it as an orchestration layer, but in the back end, we can use these fields to add exist to existing API. Another common misconception is that GraphQL writes database queries itself. I think it's probably also stems from the fact that GraphQL kind of sounds like SQL. Um, and the common misconception that people have is that you send in a complex query and some magical engine works out all the sub queries to get the data for it. And it ties it all together and sends it back to you. But basically, the thing is you need to write all the logic of the database queries yourself. So again, in your resolver, you might be talking to an API or you might be building GraphQL from ground up. In your resolver, you will need to let GraphQL know how to talk to the database or how to fetch data from the database. However, there are certain libraries that do it for you, like Neo4j and Prisma. Another common misconception is that it requires really complicated clients to get started um, and that getting data from a GraphQL server is really hard and it requires third-party client, which is problematic in sub-language. And I think one thing that this person highlighted very well is that a lot of people forget it's just an HTTP request. So let me show you how that works. Because it's an HTTP request, you can actually just make a curl command to call it. So here in this code, there is a curl command. I'm passing in some data, which is query post title, which could be just for any, uh, which is just fetching like the title of a post. And the API there is slash endpoint, slash GraphQL endpoint. So because it's an HTTP, you don't need 
any client to talk to a GraphQL API. You can just simply make a curl request. And a lot of tools actually, like I think OneGraph also does this curl command export for you. So here are the common misconceptions that we talked about. GraphQL is equal to graph or SQL, and that GraphQL only works with graph type of data. Data fetching kind of works magically. GraphQL replaces Redux. REST and GraphQL can't coexist, and it is difficult to introduce in an existing project. GraphQL is only used for front-end. GraphQL writes database queries itself, and GraphQL requires complicated clients. So now I'm going to talk briefly about what I like GraphQL, why I like GraphQL, and what are the things that I like most about GraphQL. So I've kind of worked on GraphQL from both a front-end perspective and this uh, and back-end perspective. And I think the biggest thing that I like while working on it from the front-end perspective is the type definition that comes for free with GraphQL. So no longer do I have to validate my data anymore. So for example, if I have a form and expecting that the field from this uh, or the type from this one particular field would be string, I just need to define it in my GraphQL. I don't have to like do any more validation on it. So this way I'm reducing some code that I'm writing. Another cool thing is that it brought uh, it brought our front-end teams and back-end teams closer because in the beginning of the project itself, we had to establish a contract and a schema for front-end and back-end. Because we were talking about what fields we'll be using, we also were able to shave off some fields that we're not going to be using in the front-end and hence were able to reduce the, uh, the, the payload that we were sending back. Another cool thing while working on the back end is that we had very strong analytics over the data and the fields that was being used. So instead of just like blindly deprecating any fields, we knew if a field wasn't being used, it was safe to remove it. Another cool thing, again, on working on the front end side is that I only had the data that I asked for. So this way I had very little data that I had to manage with a third party library. And one cool thing that came out of that was I, I was able to completely strip out Redux and just use React hooks to manage my state. And because we only have one rule endpoint to rule them all, it's pretty easy to talk to one endpoint and get all the data that you need. So that's why I like GraphQL. Now, if you're interested in GraphQL, I want to give some resources away so you can get started. The, the, these are the three main resources that I found very useful. The official docs at graphql.org are very straightforward and I found them pretty useful while starting. They also have best practices, so I really like them. Apollo, which is a very common client that is used for building GraphQL, has also really good documentation. And when I was getting started, I loved Prisma Docs, which is kind of like a game-based approach, like a quiz-based approach on understanding GraphQL. And I found that really fun. To try out GraphQL, you can use tools like Graphical or Playground, which lets you file a query or a mutation and see the data that you're gonna be getting back. And then on the right-hand column, you can also see that it shows basically a documentation of your query or your GraphQL API. Graphical can be found on, graph, uh, on GitHub at this URL. And here are some cool learning resources that I found. There's a lot of courses on Egghead that I found really useful for learning GraphQL. Um, the Learning GraphQL book by Eve Parcello and Alex Banks is also really useful and super relevant. I also really like the course by Steven Greider on Udemy GraphQL with React. I found it very useful, especially in the context that I was working on. If you're interested in learning more, I've also written a blog on getting started with GraphQL, which has all these resources pointed out. You can find found out that article in my GitHub, which is github.com slash shuddikapoor08. So basically, was communicate with each other, uh, how to communicate with GraphQL and REST in an API uh, how to communicate with an API using GraphQL and REST, 10 common misconceptions of GraphQL, some common things, that, some things that I really like about GraphQL, and if you're interested, how you can get started. That's all I have for you today, but I do want to leave you with a last dev joke. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, everybody. You guys have been an amazing audience. Again, you can follow me on Twitter at ShrutiKapoor08, where I will tweet the slides. And you can also follow the newsletter, tinyletter.com slash ShrutiKapoor08 for more updates on JavaScript, GraphQL, and React. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>